So in mouse models, we have tested this. Richard was able to take um, mouse models in which we have as one target biomarker CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen, but also EPCAM and VEGF. Here's one mouse in which as the tumor grows, the amount of CEA detectable in the blood from 20 microliters of blood is increasing. The same is occurring in another mouse, a third mouse, fourth mouse, fifth mouse. If you had tried to do this with an ELISA, with an optical-based detection, you would have read nothing because these are below the detection limits. So these extremely small amounts of biomarker in blood are now being picked up and can be detected. And of course, if the biomarker is not increasing proportionately, for example, in blood, you also know that. It's not to say that this can solve the issue of what biomarker to look for, but once you know what biomarker, biomarker panels you want to look for, you're able to get very reproducible, very sensitive detection using the magneto nanosensor technology. Now, this has taken us time to scale up uh, because, in fact, we have to make all the antibodies uh, be able to be spotted very precisely. And this is now the robotic spotting system that's been set up to produce thousands of chips, which is now being done uh, at Stanford. And this particular system lets us go into the magneto nanosensor platform and with preloaded antibodies go through and then lay down uh, spot by spot uh, antibodies for the uh, initial antibody pair that it takes to do uh, the ELISA uh, equivalent detection on the magneto nano platform. So this now is being deployed in ovarian cancer trials where we have information from patients for the last 10 years where the patients were screened actually with mammography and blood was collected yearly over a decade. And working with the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, we have a series of biomarkers that we're testing as part of the ovarian spore at the Hutch and Stanford and also part of our nanotechnology center to start to look to see what the lead time is where a couple of biomarkers that are detected in ovarian cancer earlier, but because we haven't had the ability to look because these samples are so precious, have the ability to look even earlier than what we can currently detect them, which is just six months or so of lead time, to see if we can detect them a couple of years ahead of the clinical diagnosis of ovarian cancer. They're also being deployed in prostate cancer. Um, it's too early to tell because we've had to scale these up, but the hope is because of their ultra sensitivity and access to very precious samples where volume and low volume is key, that we'll be able to get results that hopefully show that these kind of biomarkers are useful. Now, we're not counting on blood protein biomarkers alone because we know there's risk in that. It could be that there's not enough specificity in those biomarkers. The models are telling us that they may not be present in sufficient quantities in blood, even as the tumors get large enough because of the biomarker secretion rate. So this is where imaging forms a parallel approach and maybe the two together actually can succeed. Imaging, as you know, has been moving rapidly from purely anatomical to more biologic with newer approaches that are letting us image at the molecular level but with greater sensitivity and greater spatial resolution. Dr. Weisleder, who's here, has been pioneering efforts here in the uh, Boston area, several other groups in the Boston area, uh, several groups around uh, the country to really push uh, molecular imaging uh, to new boundaries and new spatial resolution limits. All of the workhorse of imaging are things like positron emission tomography with molecules like fluorodeoxyglucose. We've always not felt that these technologies could move easily into early detection because even if they had high enough sensitivity and specificity for larger tumors, let's say six to 10 millimeters, getting enough sensitivity and specificity for very small tumors is difficult because of the spatial resolution of these technologies. It's just not possible to see few enough cells, even if the cells accumulate a lot of the imaging agent that you inject intravenously. So a typical PET scan, when it sees foci like you see here in the mediastinum, these are still billions of cells that have accumulated the imaging agent. So we need to fundamentally move towards newer technologies that can reach into the thousands of cells, and that's something that, that we and others are trying to push for. 
And so several ways of doing that, the imaging agent itself can be a small molecule, it can be an engineered antibody, in this case a mini body that has rapid clearance from the bloodstream so that the background clears, or even nanoparticles like this carbon single wall nanotube. And the signaling system, shown in red, the walkie-talkie for the imaging agent, can be, of course, all parts of the physical spectrum. Today I'll focus predominantly on sound and a little bit on light to show you how it's able to change some of the dynamics of what we can detect in a living subject. Let's start with ultrasound, because it really has a lot of potential. Just like we are using it to modulate the tumor bed to release biomarkers, it can also be used to image the tumor bed. Although we're familiar with ultrasound in use, for example, at looking at the fetus, as shown here, the key is that it can become a more molecular tool. And because it's so simple, there's no ionizing radiation, it's already deployed worldwide, we can easily uh, come to technologies like this. And so we've developed microbubbles to be able to do this. These microbubbles are, in fact, with um, lipid shells or protein shells, and antibodies and peptides are being used to be able to, uh, uh, in fact, target these microbubbles. These bubbles oscillate in an acoustic field so that as you apply ultrasound and you yell at the bubbles, they yell back at you. And in fact, if you were to watch bubbles in blood vessels, they would move, and as they're targeted to vascular endothelial receptors, they would bind to those receptors. What this allows you to do is to reach in, and at least where neovascularization is occurring, come down and detect very small tumor sizes. You can also zap and destroy the ultrasound bubbles by sound, in fact, getting rid of the bubbles themselves. So these technologies have been used, and we've been looking at these using intravital microscopy. You might be able to see bubbles actually moving down vessels. They're the shadows. We can watch as they bind. And in fact, we've been able to develop bubbles that can bind to vascular endothelial receptors like VEGF receptor and integrin family receptors and have several of these now in progress. These are now being moved into clinical trials one with perfluorobutane as part of our ovarian spore with the Fred Hutch is now going in in ovarian cancer. And we, based on animal models and issues of understanding the amount of receptor, can detect, we feel, right at around one millimeter tumor burden. And to end um, uh, my talks here, the other area that we're looking at is photoacoustics because bubbles cannot leave the vasculature. If you have cancer-specific targets that are not in blood vessels but are extravascular, ultrasound cannot be used. So we've been building strategies to look at light as an input source and photoacoustics, so where light goes in, heats up an imaging agent infinitesimally, and that leads to sound production. So light in, sound out. And now an imaging agent becomes one that's a good absorber of light, something that's very dark and absorbs light well. And in fact, the photoacoustic images we're getting show us that we can reach to below millimeter type spatial resolutions and start to detect tens of thousands of cells that express, for example, a cell surface receptor. Using newer technologies and capacitive micromachined ultrasound, we've built transducers that do very good job in listening and can listen to these particular um, 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 signals from within the body. And these are now moving into the clinic with a transrectal probe in which CMUD arrays are being put in and imaging agents that range from different absorbers will go in to, in fact, be able to detect low tumor burdens below a millimeter in size. And these are not just nanoparticles, but they also include small imaging agents. So it's an exciting time. I'll end there by saying that there's a lot of things that are brought together, both in in vitro and in vivo diagnostics. I've shown and just highlighted a few of them. Each one is a long story in itself. But I think we have to focus our efforts into early detection. It's a hard problem. But if all of us put our minds together to do it, I think it's a solvable problem. Thank you very much.